Hello and welcome to another Build a Soil YouTube video. Today we have season five, FAQ number four. And as per usual, I've got the printout from Dean. I've not looked at it. I'm gonna open them and we're just gonna jump right into the questions. If for some reason I can't answer it, I'll tell you that I don't know. And if I can, I'm gonna do my best. So let's get going. Bubba says, some of my indoor plants got PM. Oh man, uh, I sprayed the whole milk and a few other things, but it keeps coming back. Any suggestions? Man, this is a difficult one. So powdery mildew is one of those that is a big challenge. I'll share a few things that I know about powdery mildew, but I can't give you a, a bulletproof answer here. You're gonna have to try a number of things, but I can get you through the season for sure. And then you have to decide, are you gonna keep the plant around? What are you gonna do? Because that's usually the hardest thing. When it comes to powdery mildew, those, there's over a hundred different types of powdery mildew. And depending on where you live, it may be present and the conditions get right this time of year, you know, right when it's transitioning over into flower. Sometimes there's moisture or a little less heat or whatever it is that allows it to kind of take hold. And so oftentimes we'll have growers reach out and they'll say, oh my gosh, I found powdery mildew on a plant on my property and I'm worried it's gonna get on my cannabis. Typically the same type of powdery mildew has a very narrow host range. So it can't go from plant to plant to plant. They're usually fairly specific on what they, uh, what they actually host on. However, if you do have it on your cannabis plants, then of course you know it's one of the PMs that will infect cannabis and you've got to do something about it immediately. I've had some experience in the past with it. I do know that personal experience shares that it's very difficult to get rid of. And one of the things that happens is if my hand is the leaf, when you spray the first time, it kind of washes it off. But like roots of a plant, it's anchored actually into your plant. It's not fully systemic, but it'll actually anchor into the tissue of your plant so without repeated process, without repeated spray and defoliation and other things, it's gonna be difficult to get rid of. And I've been able to beat it in the past. However, I don't know for sure because eventually I let go of those moms and I didn't flower them anymore. And so it could have been that it came back. I've seen it show up before, friends grows in different places and I've seen it be very, very difficult to remove. And even when it's gone down to just a clone that's rerooted and completely you know, disease free, so to speak, it can come back later in flower and it's a nightmare. So what I personally do is I just don't hold anything. I don't take clones from anybody and the moms that I have, I grew from seed. And if for some reason I was to have a wild infection, I'd probably get rid of it just because I don't like to waste six months to a year of my time battling something and losing sleep over it. And no one cut is that special in my opinion. I know some other people think that their clones are very special and they're, they're worth putting up the fight. So do whatever you have to do. Now, let's get all the way right back around to the answer. Outdoors right now, here's what I do. I grab EM5. You can look up the ingredients. You can make something similar on your own. You don't have to buy it from us. But the whole goal is to use something very gentle that will not harm your flowers. So you can spray very late all the way up to harvest and you can make sure to make it a nightmare for that PM to actually take over and grow on your plant. It may be that you completely eradicate it and you don't see it come back at all. But if you try and take, you know, re-veg it or whatever to keep that plant around, it may be a problem in the future. So what I do is I spray, I get a good sprayer. You wanna spray the underside of the leaves, starting with the bottom of the plant, working your way up, then flip to the top side of the leaves and get every nook and cranny, spray all of the buds. The other thing that I do is I do a little cleaning up. If it's an outdoor grow and it's at home, I would be in there defoliating, uh, defoliating a lot of the ugly leaves, removing anything that had powdery mildew on it, and then getting rid of that material and then immediately doing this spray routine. And I would do it every single day for at least three days and then after that, I would do it at minimum once per week or whatever you're comfortable with. And I would also be looking at the areas where you saw growth and then revisiting each time after I spray. And let's say you go three days straight and you decide to give it a few days break, check and see if any of it's coming back. The EM5 is the best I've ever used for it. I don't find that it affects flowers whatsoever. And it is a cleaning property that has vinegar, organic apple cider vinegar. It has small amounts of essential oil, not enough to hurt the, the hash or anything like that. It off gases very, very quickly. It's just so gentle. It doesn't hurt the plants at all, even in deep flower. So that would be my recommendation. I would be going pretty hard too. The first day or maybe the first three days, instead of the one or two ounces per gallon, I'd probably go to four to six ounces per gallon of something like that and go hard. Alternatively, you could use Dr. Bronner's or Growing Organic makes a Castile soap. If you have something that you can do right away, I would get after it. And you can use one ounce per gallon of a Castile soap. That is a little bit harsher on the buds. And so I don't like to do it as it gets deeper in flower, but you could dilute it a little more. Those are just suggestions. Now in veg, the neem with ag sill has worked really, really well. And another thing that I've seen licensed commercial grows do is just use saponin like Qyaha or use something like um, soap nuts. You can actually make your own. Um, Anthony, a buddy of mine, 
Hope you're doing well, Anthony, if you're watching this, but he's had a lot of success and one of their preventative routines as well as eradication and large commercial grows was to use soap nut and to grind up a small amount of water and then to strain that out and make your fresh sap and an extract. I would just grab the Q, it's the easiest, and I would go hard on it. I don't think it's gonna eradicate it, but it really, really knocks it back. And so maybe alternating with the EM5 and that would be a good strategy. And you might already have some of those on hand right now. So hopefully that answers your question. For those that are watching, that's another reason why I don't take in clones. And it's, if, I do, if I do get something, I would rather just get rid of it. And knock on wood, we've been really lucky in the YouTube series not to have to document this type of stuff live. And I wanna keep it that way. Next question, Randy um, said, hey, hey, quick question about the Q. Do you have to apply this using a Chapin to be most effective? Or can you mix supply with a general hand watering can? Love everything you do. Okay, so using any sprayer is gonna make a foliar spray more effective. And part of that is that we want a, the, the micron size of the bead of water to be smaller to get a cleaner spread on the leaf, especially if we're trying to feed or eradicate, we wanna have a really good coverage on that leaf. Even in the Jadam farming book that teaches you to make all your own stuff um, all naturally, they really, really talk about using zero parts per million or soft water, they call it, reverse osmosis water, and making sure that you are treating that very clean water with a wetting agent to maximize spread. And that's how you're able to take something organic and natural and make it much more effective. So yes, you need something, does not have to be a Chapin sprayer. Get any sprayer. We like the Chapin because it was kind of the flagship of no-till. Coot turned us onto those back in the day. They're pretty industrial, but any sprayer will work. And then you wanna take that wand so you can hit all the parts of the plant and start at the underside on the bottom part of the plant, working your way up. Otherwise the leaves droop and you can't get them. And then start with the top and spray down. And you should have really good results doing that type of method. Now, if you use just a watering can and you put it on there, it's gonna have some effect, but most of it's just gonna go in the soil and big drops are gonna beat up and fall off your leaf. So foliar is better with a proper sprayer, okay? Even if you just have a little home sprayer, right? Better than nothing. Great question, Randy, thank you for asking. Okay, WK00 says, Jeremy, you mentioned ebb and flow in, of water in nature a lot in your videos. You say it's healthy for plants to have some dry down periods occasionally. What about an ebb and flow for VPD, temp, etc.? In nature, there might be a cold day or a cold breeze, etc. Do you think there is any advantage or disadvantage to a fluctuating environment? Just curious if I should use that cycle to introduce some fluctuations like letting the temp and humidity drop during lights off, or should I just set to the build as well spreadsheet values and write it out? Thanks for the great content. It's really appreciated. Man, this is a super good question. So I don't think nature is ever just like one thing all the time. And so I set my nighttime to be lower humidity. That way it's evacuating all the air all the time and exchanging fresh air. And I also want it to be a lower temperature just to mimic what nature does. It's typically cooler at night, warmer in the day. I don't wanna confuse my plants. I think that's the way to go. And I take it a step further as I get later in flower, I like to dim the lights just a little bit. And I do like to run cooler. And I think that that absolutely does help. And so mimic nature for whatever it's worth. I wouldn't really be over critical in thinking about this. One thing I will say is that while it's good to have some sort of positive stress on the plants, we don't want swings too far in one direction. So if I've ever been lazy on a home grow and not watered and I got wilt or like dry down and the plant started to just wilt a little bit and then I watered them, I yielded less and the quality wasn't quite as good. And so that stress was too far. Where a little bit of dry down is fine. Temperature swings fine. I would rather see just writing out the parameters of build a soil and being very comfortable mimicking nature to have some highs and lows that are a little more spread out between the day and night. And certainly as it gets closer to winter and what would be final flowering as we creep to croptober, I like to mimic that in the grow room as well. I don't want it to be the hottest time when I'm finishing flower. I like it to be cooler. Some people even use cold water to mimic that effect when they're watering. I don't take it that far, but the water is usually fairly cool. So that's one reason. If I was on a farm where the water was like sitting out and hot, I'd probably consider what I could do to cool it. So just the way you're thinking, I think is already on track, but the danger is like overdoing it. So just keep it basic, mimic nature. I think you're gonna crush it. And that was a really, really good question. I do think that there is a natural flow there. And you hear people crop steering by trying to, you know, have a little bit less water. And there's, there's all these ways to elicit the best response from your plant. Not every cutting is the same. So some people, when they get a prized cut, they really, really enjoy. They mess around with different ways to grow it and see what's their absolute favorite way. I know AJ growing organic, he mentioned that when running GMO, he would run cooler temperatures for some specific reasons and got a better stack out of the flower, got better odors out of it. And that's how he won the, the home growers cup. So I take that information with a grain of salt because each grows different, but I think there's something there and I think it's important. All right, uh, Rivers says, hey, Jeremy, question. If I, wanna, if I want to water using real fresh coconut water, what's the ratio of cocoa to water? Thanks. Okay, this is a great question. So when we first started, Clackamas Coot said, find a coconut, 
crack it open, you want a young green coconut and do a quarter cup per gallon. And a lot of us were running and gra grabbing like harmless harvest. They're like the refrigerated all the way from harvest right to the store and they're super expensive coconut water. They're really good. But a lot of guys were finding like the purple one, like the one out of 50 that's purple and they'd pour that in their water and that was their go-to coconut. Eventually we found that the most cost effective way was to get that single ingredient product that was freeze dried the moment it was harvested. So that's why we use the powder. But gosh, if you have access to fresh coconuts, I'd be keeping half for me and half for the plants and I would be comfortable doing a quarter cup to a half cup per gallon. But man, I'd love, I'd love to have that opportunity. I hope one day I do and I'll just leave it at that. So great, great question. Um, also, for those of you watching, I don't think the coconuts at the store are as fresh as like if you had a tree. If you live somewhere where there's no coconuts, I think our freeze dried powder is the way to go. Same, you'll find aloe vera leaf at the grocery store. That was harvested a long time ago and sat there. We want something that is immediately utilized. So fresh is better, freeze dried is second to that. Grocery store, not quite as good, but if you have access to like a live aloe, a live coconut plant or a coconut tree, that's what we're after. That would be ideal. Okay. Uh, McLean says, I've been wanting to get a PAR meter and was considering an Apogee, but then had the idea to buy a Pulse Pro that would also monitor the humidity, temp, and VTBD. So I guess my question is regarding the quality of the PAR meter and the Pulse compared to the Apogee. Any thoughts? You know, I think they're probably really similar. And the app may have improved, but one of the things I did not like is if I was using it strictly for PAR meter purposes, I like to wave my PAR meter around the whole canopy and just actively watch the readings see it go up and down when I move the light, when I get next to a cola, when I go deeper in the canopy. To me, that gives me an overall picture and it gives me a better gut feeling of what my light and the entire footprint is doing. Where when I used the pulse in the past, you had to hold it and then take like a, a reading off of it and that would, event, that would give you a reading back to your phone app. And so it was like a reading here, a reading there. Totally usable and I think still a great quality. I have nothing bad to say about pulse. I think they're a really, really good company but I like just getting the readings and I don't think you really need to go as far as getting an Apogee. When I got that, I was really worried that it wouldn't read LEDs right if I got some other meter, but I really feel like most of the meters that are out there, if they're rated for full spectrum, they're gonna give you a baseline to go off of that's pretty accurate. That's my, that's my thoughts on, on the meter. However, I do love the Apogee, it's, it's pretty rad. I, I, I um, lend it to people locally as well if they wanna dial in, so. Kyle, curious, why is it not good to use RootWise Microbe Complete in flower? Anyone know? Uh, just a waste of money, meaning the Microbe Complete was the originally designed product. You could use it all the way through. But one of the things that is important, especially like when you're doing acreage, is making sure that we're using the best tool for the job, not just a tool that can get the job done. And so the mycorrhizae in RootWise Microbe Complete is expensive. And that mycorrhizae is supposed to associate with your plant roots immediately upon seed germination. But later in flower, that association should already be long taking place and well developed. And when we get later in flower, it's more about that phosphorus mobilization. So the biophos has more enzyme producers that feed the phosphorus mobilizers that break down and deliver phosphorus. And that's important. Um, it's one of the number one things that's gonna affect yield and quality. I think calcium's most important, phosphorus is right after that. And what we used to do was just jack phosphorus, but that would mess up the soil and it wouldn't lead to as much balance. And I think what's better is to keep it maybe two to one, three to one at the most for P to K. And instead of like the old super soil recipes that would just lend themselves to getting off the chart and, and pee, we utilize, a lot, ut, uh, we utilize a mobilizer and the biophos is just better. I don't think it would hurt at all to use Microbe Complete. However, it might not be as efficient on the wallet. If you don't have biophos, you do have Microbe Complete and you wanna make sure that you're inoculating with something, you totally can do it. But I think that if you've been inoculating all the way up to flour, you could probably leave it, just use the enzymes. Otherwise, biophos is my go-to for flour. So, um, great question. Roan. Have you used the EcoWit in a 30 gallon? If so, what would you say the optimal moisture range around 35 like in the beds? Yeah, very, very similar. I think that the overall difference is that in a 30, you might be a little more cognizant about the size of the container versus the size of the plant. Where in a bed, if you have small plants, you can overwater easy. But in a bed with raging plants, it becomes more like a 30 gallon. Because if you figure I have in a four by four, you know, um, more than hundred gallons, but not quite 200 gallons because of the, the height of it, that's like having four 30 gallons there, which would be 120 gallons. And so I have four plants in there. It acts very similarly. So your plant count, the amount of root mass in the soil in relation to the um, actual container size is very important there. 
And of course, if you're in peak stretch, all those things, you know that you can water and keep it on the wetter side because they're drinking so heavily. However, when it's late flower or smaller plants, I may not go quite so high on the watering because I know they can't dig their way back out of it. However, I've found the numbers, the way they come set from the factory to be the same. I usually water and sometimes it'll flash a 60 on there, but it settles in at like 42%, 41%, 45% on the high end. And then it slowly moves its way down to 35% where I feel like is a pretty good sweet spot. And as it gets down to like 32%, I might let it ride one more day. If it gets below 30, I'm watering. Uh, otherwise, if the plant's big, I might water right when it's at 35, up to 40, 35 to 40. So that seems to be an ideal range for me. And I, I hope that works the same for you. Great question. Okay, uh, last one on here. Skips, is it bad if I'm seeing roots at the bottom of the watering tube in my earth box? Well, I need to try to clean those out before running another cycle in it. It's my first grow. I've noticed roots down there a couple days ago after watering down the tube for the first time. I just flipped to flower now. Just wondering if I'll need to clean it out before next run. Thanks. I love the channel and the BAS products. This is a really good question. Nobody's asked it before. And your first question is, is it good? Very, very good to see roots growing down there. That means your plant is pumping. And it's very unlikely that you can overwater at that point. It's got roots down in the container. It's drinking that water. And you'll notice when you go to stretch, when you flip to flower, it's really going to be drinking. And then all of a sudden at day 14, 15, 16, somewhere in there at flower, it'll slow down. And so you're not going to have to water nearly as much after that. But as far as your question goes, you will not have to clean them out. It's totally fine. When you set up the earth box, little bits of soil falls down in there. The roots die in there. I've cleaned out multiple deep three, four cycle deep no-tills and there wasn't like some crazy matting of roots. Somehow it just all works itself out. However, I do feel like there's some limitations. I don't think it's gonna last hundred cycles like I would think a four by four bed could. It may be worth cleaning out at some point, but I have had great luck not cleaning it out after my first cycle and just running with it. Totally up to you. Earth box are pretty amazing. You can definitely dump it, reamend it, put it back in, clean it all out and it'll work great. Or you could no-till it and see how you like it. Moisture management, slightly different on the second and third round, but honestly, they work great almost any way you do it. So thank you so much for all these questions. I hope that I answered your question. And if you've got some like this, we wanna go through and answer as many as we can every single season. So drop your questions in here. Otherwise, like, subscribe, tell your friends. As always, thank you so much for following. And I'll see you guys on the next Build a Soil YouTube video.